Hello, baby. Welcome to the Smart People Podcast. Sit back, grab a drink, tune in your brain. Ask not what your country can do for you. This nation will rise up. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Smart People Podcast, the podcast for those that are smart, those that think they're smart, and those that want to be smarter. I am your host, Chris Stemp, and alongside me, my co-host, Mr. John Rojas. Hey, John, how you doing? What's going on, man? You hanging in there? I am hanging in there. Taking you excited, a break from work. You excited for this week's episode? Very excited. I, you know, it was unfortunate that I couldn't make the actual episode, but got to check out the interview and it was uh, super interesting. So well done. Yeah. Yeah. I do what I can. You know, that's teamwork right there. Today we interv- uh, just a quick summary and we'll get into the rest later. But today we interview Dr. Jeff Marcy and we're going to talk about some of the craziest stuff that goes on outside of this planet. This dude basically discovered like every planet that we know about to some degree. So we'll get into that. But John, you had some things you wanted to talk about first. I do. So if you head over to smartpeoplepodcast.com, you might notice a little change to the website. Um, I, I got a lot of emails and questions about how to actually access our Amazon page. So I figured I'd make it a little bit easier and I added an Amazon banner to the top of the page. So now anytime you go to Amazon through our page, you just click the banner at the top, it takes you over to Amazon and everything you purchase, we get a percentage, helps us out. Well, it only took you like what five months to change it from a half inch by half inch block to something that people could actually find. That's true. Did you have any idea you could even do that? I mean, I had an idea. I just don't know how to do it. So that's where you come in. That is your specialty. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Just click on the top. That's all you got to do. So we appreciate that. Also, make sure to check us out on Facebook, Smart People Podcast, or Twitter, Smart People Pod. I like seeing the friend numbers go up, you know, so it makes my day. So it's a small thing you can do. It takes two minutes. Really appreciate it. Go check us out there and at our website, smartpeoplepodcast.com, as John alluded to. So now I'll get into a little bit more about this week's episode. Uh, Dr. Marcy, he's a leading astrophysicist in the detection and characterization of exoplanets. Just to give you a background, he's a professor of astronomy at UC Berkeley. He is the director of Berkeley's Center for Integrative Planetary Science, elected member of the National Academy of Sciences. He, he won in 2003. He was elected Discovery Magazine Space Scientist of the Year, and he was the co-recipient of the prestigious Shaw Prize. And he literally has been on every, I don't know, you know form of media you can imagine, ABC, NBC, CBS, Time, BBC, Washington Post, I mean, Scientific American, CNN, it goes on and on. But he's just an awesome dude, and he doesn't have a book to promote. He's not selling you anything. When we ask him at the end, he just said, I don't know, check out NASA.gov, I think it was. And he just wants to tell everybody what he's doing and kind of make this crazy science stuff a little more understandable, if you will. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, I wasn't able to sit down and and conduct the interview, but I did get a chance to listen to it. And I found it interesting in the sense that even though we had interviewed Dr. Krauss a few episodes ago, Dr. Marcy actually put everything in simple, easy to understand terms. And I don't want to say dumbed it down, but you know, he made it easy for me to understand what he was talking about. And I completely enjoyed that. Yeah. And I also, I, I think, you know, Although his specialty is in finding other planets, and we talk about that a little bit, you can tell that's where his passion lies. I mean, I asked him all types of things because, again, he's he's a leading expert in astrology, astronomy, the, the universe, things like that. So he's done his homework, and you could ask him anything. He's probably going to be one of the smartest people I'll ever get to talk to regarding those issues. So I definitely dive into some things that... We all wonder, especially 
when they talk about these crazy things like we found something 13 billion light years away or whatever it is how, how is that possible so i ask him that and he kind of explains in in true fashion you know here's what we know and here's what's still kind of up for debate and i think that's really interesting too so i hope you guys enjoy this as much as i did here is our interview with dr jeff marcy so have you always been interested in the universe did you know you wanted to make a career out of it i mean Many kids have stared up at the sky and wondered what what is out there, but often that's kind of where it stops. Well, you know, in my case, it's funny you mentioned a kid staring up at the sky. Mm -hmm. um, when I was 13 years old, I can remember my parents bought me a poster of the solar system, and it sat on my wall right next to my bed. So I had a little twin bed, and right on the, the wall was this picture of the sun and Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, all the moons of all the planets were there and the rings of Saturn. And I stared at that poster and I was just amazed at the, the beautiful uh, images of Jupiter and the rings of Saturn and all the moons that went around them. And I remember being pretty captivated at that age uh, about the sort of beauty and clockwork uh, of the universe. Uh, of course, that was just the solar system, but that was enough. And then uh, the next year, my parents, having noticed that I was staring at that poster, they bought me a used reflecting telescope four inches in diameter pretty small telescope and it kind of beat up but i still have that telescope to this day <laughs> i loved that thing i took it out onto the roof of our house in in los angeles uh -huh. and i would look at saturn and, and the andromeda galaxy and really just uh i was quite taken by the the enormous grandeur uh, and and exquisite beauty of the universe Right. Okay. So you did know kind of early on that this is what you liked. Well, I knew it's what I liked, but I certainly didn't think you could make a living at it. How did <laughs> you make a living uh, sketching images of Saturn's moons? I right. Mean, that just that just that never occurred to me. And even when I went to college at UCLA, I thought, well, I'll I'll be a science major. I'll I majored in physics and I took some astronomy classes. Uh, but I I didn't think that you know I didn't think you could become an astronomer. I didn't know anybody who was an astronomer and. And I also didn't think I was smart enough to be an astronomer, so so I had a lot of strikes against me there. Well, actually, that's another good topic I'd like to just bring up quickly. How did you take it to the next step? I mean, how did you get to where you are? Obviously, you know, I was reading about you and went to your page, and you've really done a lot in the field, and it's quite incredible. So I was wondering, how does that come about? I um. I was taking physics and chemistry and math classes at UCLA, and I thought, you know, I'll dabble in astronomy. I really loved astronomy. But when I graduated from UCLA, I applied to graduate schools, and I thought, well, I'll, gee, I'll apply to graduate schools to try to get a Ph.D. in astronomy. Uh, but I didn't know if I would get into any graduate schools um, and, again, whether I was good enough to even be an astronomer. But a few schools actually accepted me. In fact, a lot of schools <laughs> accepted me into their graduate program. And so I just took it one step at a time. When I went to graduate school at UC Santa Cruz, I felt, you know, like I was just going to do the best I could. I wasn't the smartest kid, that was for sure. But um, every step of the way, I just said, well, I'll keep going and see how far I get. And when I fail, you know, I'll drop out and I will know that I've done the best I could do and had a good time. And, and that would be that. Somehow it all just, you know, every step of the way, the, the world uh, kept opening the door and saying, okay, keep going. You know, when I got my PhD, I got a postdoctoral fellowship that was a really nice, prestigious one. I, I couldn't believe it. And so, you know, every step, something good happened. All right. Well, for our listeners who are unaware, can you kind of give us an overview of what it is that you do? I know you have a specialty, which I'd like to hear about, but I'd also like to know kind of in the grander scheme what you do. Well, people say, in a nutshell, that I'm a planet hunter, uh, and they say it a little bit uh, in a joking way, but, but that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years or so. I've developed uh, techniques to discover planets around other stars, planets that orbit other stars that you can't see, even with the most powerful telescopes, even with Hubble, you can't actually see planets, at least not easily, that orbit other stars. They're, they're, the planets are just lost in the glare of the host star, even with Hubble. And so we've developed some new techniques, and 
uh, one technique that, uh, that I developed that was very successful was to watch the star, not the planet, because you can't see the planet, watch the star to see as it wobbles in space as it's yanked on gravitationally by the planet. So a planet going around a star is held, of course, by gravity, but in turn the planet yanks gravitationally on the star, making the star uh, wobble around every orbit of the planet. So we were able to do that, and we actually used the Doppler effect, measure the orbits of the planets, the masses of the planets, uh, the occurrence rate of the planets. So we learned an enormous amount. We found Jupiter-sized planets, Saturn-sized, Neptune-sized planets, and we're uh, heading toward finding the first Earth-like planets uh, in the universe. While we're on the subject of things I completely don't understand, um, months ago we did an episode on astronomy, as I mentioned to you earlier, and at that time we had some listeners that kind of equated astronomy and these new discoveries to a type of religion because it's so hard to fathom these things that are so difficult to understand. So what is your response to that in terms of, for just the average Joe, these things are so far-fetched. Have we really nailed it down to a science where you can say these things with any real certainty? This is a great question. And I'll tell you, um, uh, there are a bunch of answers, but I'll give you one that just grabs me. Um, in science, it's very competitive. Uh, there are a lot of astronomers, for example, in the world. And when one astronomer makes a claim that they've discovered, let's say, a planet around another star, other astronomers would love to show that that first astronomer was wrong. It's sort of a badge of honor to be able to say, oh, I, I made better measurements, I'm smarter, I have a better telescope, and I've just shown that you know, astronomer X was wrong because I've done it better. And so that's the competitive sort of dog-eat-dog -dog world of science that you don't hear much about. Uh, in which egos are involved and people are trying to one-up each other. And that's healthy. That's a good thing because what happens is this. I go out with the, uh, with the telescopes I have at hand. I discover a new planet, or at least I claim to do so. And now other scientists go out and they use their equipment, their telescopes. They try to shoot me down. They try to find, take data, actual uh, measurements that show that I was wrong, and they can publish a paper saying I was wrong. And that's the beauty of science, that we have a culture in which doubt and skepticism really prevail. If somebody says something uh, in, in science in general, and certainly in astrophysics, and it turns out to be wrong, the other scientists jump on that first scientist and, and uh, write papers, publish papers, showing that the first person was wrong. So it's, it's very hard to go out and uh, make claims and get away with it if you're wrong. The, the bottom line is, in science, Somebody else, somebody else who doesn't really agree with you should still be able to do the experiment, make the measurements, and say yes or no about the results you've claimed. And I, I love that. That's a great answer. And it's something I didn't know because personally, I believe that. I mean, that checks and balances system is great. We put our faith in numerous things that we have nothing close to that checks and balances and it seems only logical that we trust something that is verified by so many different intelligent people. Well, I really agree with that. And, you know, just to amplify what you've said, think about prominent people in our public lives. Uh, for example, um, you know, government officials, politicians, they might say something. Oh, we should cut taxes and, the, you know, the society will be better. Or somebody else says, you know, we should change the law on immigration and society will be better. But there's no way to check that. You know, people can just say anything. It's their belief. In religion, similarly, you know, one priest can stand up and say one thing about what happened 2,000 years ago. A rabbi can stand up. Somebody in a mosque can stand up and say something. Uh, but you can't easily check the, the belief that God did this or some miracle happened, you know, 3,000 years ago. Uh, but in science, the hallmark is Whatever it is you claim, whatever discovery you think you've made or, or, or um, theory you think you have, somebody else has to be able to come along and verify it. If they can't, your theory or your observations aren't worth very much. I'm glad we asked that because that's something I hadn't realized. Now, I'd like to go back to what you were saying about finding Earth-like planets. You mentioned in a previous conversation that we had that there's a new NASA Kepler mission to discover those Earth-like planets. I was hoping you could tell us a little more about that, 
because coming from someone who doesn't know much about it all, it sounds kind of science fiction almost. Well, this is absolutely unprecedented. NASA launched two years ago, March 2009, a, a telescope in space called the Kepler Space Telescope. And this telescope does one thing unbelievably well, much better than the Hubble. It takes pictures, snapshots, with a digital camera at the back of it, of 150,000 stars every minute, minute after minute. And it simply measures the brightness of those stars that come out in those pictures. And the idea is this. If a planet should be orbiting that star, any one of the 150,000 stars, and if that planet crosses in front of the star, there will be a little blockage of the starlight, oh, dimming okay. the star a little bit, and the star will dim every single time the planet orbits in front of the star over and over and over again, giving you a repeatable uh, detection of this dimming of the star, telling you for sure that it has a planet. But it's better than that. The time it takes in between dimmings tells you the so-called orbital period, the time of the orbit, and also the amount of dimming. Does the star dim by 1% or a tenth of a percent or a hundredth of a percent? That amount of dimming tells you how big the planet is. The larger the diameter of the planet, the more starlight the planet blocks. So you gain knowledge of the orbit and the size of the planet with this Kepler telescope. And I can tell you that we've already discovered over 1,300 planets, or planet candidates as we call them, because some of them might turn out to be wrong, but, and, but we're checking them, right. and most of them are undoubtedly right. So this is an absolute avalanche of planets uh, around other stars that we humans are finding for the first time. And that's unbelievable. That's such a great explanation, because I can totally picture how that works and why it works, and I don't know, I just get fired up when learning things like that. It's a neat thing. It's a simple idea. Even a, a first grader can understand the yeah. techniques you're using. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when you say Earth-like, what does that mean exactly? It it doesn't mean that there's water or oxygen or a chance of life or something like that, does it? Guess what? What? You've just asked the most profound question <laughs> for which we don't have an answer. And I'll embellish your question with uh, with. Uh, some ideas about how ignorant we are. It's kind of a fun thing. The term Earth-like really begs the question, what properties does a planet have to have to render it like the Earth? <laughs> and we actually don't know what it is about our own planet Earth that makes it special. Is it the size, the, the chemical composition, the silicate mantle, the iron nickel core? Is it the atmosphere with its oxygen and nitrogen and other uh, constituents? Is it the temperature of the Earth? Is it the, the acidity of the Earth? Is it the presence of the moon that somehow uh, guards the Earth? Or maybe the planet Jupiter helps guard the Earth. You know, what are the properties of the Earth that make it Earth-like? It's kind yeah. of a humorous, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, who was buried in Grant's tomb kind of thing. Yeah. But we really don't know, you know, what makes the Earth special. And, and, and of course, there's one really hidden uh, aspect of the Earth that, that is looming behind the, the, the question of, of the properties that make it Earth-like, that looming issue is biology, life. The Earth is still, to this day, the only planet we know that has life on it. And so the question really that comes down to, what's so special about our planet Earth that allows it to uh, support life, allows life to evolve to intelligent species like humans, uh, that is somehow different from the other planets, certainly in our own solar system, like Mars and Venus, that have certainly no intelligent life and maybe no life at all. Actually, this was going to be a question I was going to ask at some point. Anytime I get a chance to speak with someone as knowledgeable as yourself, I have to get their opinion. Are we going to find life, and are we going to do it anytime soon? I'm really hoping that it happens while I'm alive, so I'm hoping the answer is yes, but I was wondering what you think. Well, it's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a frustrating situation because, to back up a minute, we all have watched Star Trek and Star Wars, and we've read science fiction novels and other science fiction, you know, Avatar and so on. It seems like, according to science fiction, the Milky Way galaxy is teeming with intelligent life. 
And so it's frustrating that, in fact, scientifically, we actually haven't gotten a shred of evidence that there's any life out there in the universe at all. Now, that's not to say that it's not out there, but it's uh, rather, I would say, a daunting task to, to discover life on some other planet, maybe a planet around another star. And it's not clear. We don't know how long it will be next month, next year, next decade, or maybe not for over a century that we discover uh, life elsewhere. So it's, it's just one of these scientific uh, journeys, uh, a quest, where you really don't know if the treasure is out there beyond your reach, you know, just beyond arm's length, or whether we really have a long ways to go. Right. It is frustrating. And, you know, I'll tell you what keeps me going, actually. When I think about stuff like this, I was talking with a friend the other day, and we were talking about how if you would have tried to explain the telephone or the television to someone a couple hundred years ago, they'd look at you like you're crazy. I mean, you know, transmitting waves or audio video across wires and all that across the world, it just sounds impossible. So it always makes me excited because it makes me think that things we think are impossible today could, in the near or distant future, actually happen. Do you ever think about that in terms of even things like time travel or teleporting? Yeah, it's a very good question, you know, and I'll just to embellish what you said, you can imagine uh, Native Americans living here in North America, uh, say 400 years ago, trying to contact alien life using smoke signals. <laughs> Completely silly, and yeah. they might be wondering why they haven't received smoke signals back <laughs> from those intelligent, uh, you know, uh, species out there. And of course, as you say, it's because our technology may be so primitive even today right. that we haven't appreciated what are the actual technological breakthroughs that will allow us to communicate with other species. And indeed, maybe we're so primitive that uh, they deem us, uh, you know, sort of no more than we deem bugs, you know, that we may seem so primitive that they don't bother even trying to communicate with us. Having said that, you know, it's, it's a little bit daunting still that we do have laws of physics that, yeah, maybe they're, they're sort of immature, but there's a thing called the speed of light that seems to be the cosmic speed limit. It's very hard to imagine that we're wrong, that, uh, you know, that the speed of light is the ultimate speed limit, but maybe we are wrong. But, you know, people have thought very hard about it, including Lawrence Krauss, by the way, and, uh, and everybody agrees not seem does not seem likely that we're going to be able to transport people over large distances. So, you know, the idea of us humans traveling to the stars, uh, you know, perhaps uh, traveling like Star Trek from one star system to the next, th those hopes and dreams are still sort of in the fantasy world. There's no real technology. There's not even really uh, the, the uh, basics of science. Uh, physics, for example, that seems to render that a real strong possibility. But you know, you never know, and so we have to keep we have to keep hunting for new laws of physics and science, new technologies that might allow us to travel to the stars. And while we're on the subject of the new technologies, I was hoping you could talk about maybe some new technologies that you might be aware of that we do have coming out. I know you told me earlier that there are plans for constructing the world's largest telescope. Well, there's something so exciting going on right now in the United States and internationally that I'm jumping out of my socks. Uh, we're trying to build the world's largest telescope. This would be a telescope, we call it the 30-meter telescope, TMT for short. We call it that because the mirror that collects the light would have a diameter of 30 meters. That's about 30 yards. Think about that. A football field is 100 yards across. So this would be a telescope with a mirror that is a third the size of a football field, polished to a parabolic shape, uh, good and smooth, to within a fraction of the wavelength of light. So it would be a gargantuan telescope, allow us to detect the most distant galaxies and stars that are all the way back, uh, the light having come to us from nearly the time of the Big Bang. So wow. it's a very exciting telescope. We have, uh, I can tell you how much... A little bit more about it, if you're interested. It's it's being built by the University of California in conjunction with Caltech okay. and uh, Japan, China, and India, and Canada. 
Uh, so there are uh, four international partners, as, along with US, uh, United States uh, universities, and we've uh, garnered funding uh, from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, a lot of money, I might say, well over $200 million. So we're, um, we're well on our way to building this thing, and it will be located on the big island of Hawaii, oh, high atop nice. a uh, hopefully dormant volcano called Mauna Kea. Wow, that's, that's incredible. And so this will hopefully expand our view of the universe. Is, is that the goal? You know, there's several capabilities of such a large telescope, and one of them is really, and as you say, to expand our view, but literally so, in the sense that such a large telescope allows you to see galaxies that are very, very far away, so far that they're extremely faint, and so you need a big telescope to detect those faint galaxies and to study them, and, and galaxies that are very far away sent their light to us some 10, 11, or 12 billion years ago. And the light is, has been traveling here all this time. And that long ago, of course, was just about the time of the Big Bang. So by detecting galaxies that are far away, we're seeing them as they were when the universe was just a baby. Okay, so here's something that just came to me. The Big Bang, we estimate, happened about, what, 13 billion years ago or so? That's right. Okay, so is there a possibility, I mean, what if we just made a telescope that's 40 meters long? Could we see to the actual Big Bang? I mean, is it just a matter of distance and size? You know, it actually isn't, and, and uh, it would be nice if true. Here's the funny thing. Early in the universe, the first few hundreds of thousands of years and even millions of years, uh, there were no galaxies. There weren't even any stars. And in fact, in the first few minutes of the universe, there weren't even any atoms like hydrogen atoms and carbon atoms, oxygen atoms, they hadn't been built up, they hadn't been uh, synthesized yet from the, the quarks and the energy uh, and the gluons and so on that were floating around the universe, the photons. So um, we can only look back so far with regular optical telescopes. We need other techniques uh, to see back even farther. Yeah, I mean, it just came to me, and I figured it sounds like the bigger the better. Yeah, it's, no, it's a good idea, but the, but the basic point you said is exactly right. The bigger the telescope, the farther back in space and in time you can look. So just from your opinion, what do you think the importance of searching for these planets is? What does astronomy provide us with, and I guess planet searching specifically? Well, the main goal in uh, detecting planets around other stars is to open up new real estate that we can sell in lots and try to make a lot of money. <laughs> Now, this really doesn't, it's a very interesting issue that uh, <laughs> hunting for planets and indeed discovering the nature of our solar system, other stars, galaxies, and the universe, you know, it's, it's, there's no profit here. There's no practical application. You're, you're not going to have a, a better cell phone or, you know, better television reception or something like that. Um, it, we're not going to improve the, the quality of life here on the Earth, at least in material ways. Um, the real value in finding out about the universe, what it's made of, how it got to be the way it is, how our Earth fits in. Those questions really are what you would call aesthetic questions. They're, they're beautiful questions. We'd like to know, we humans would, how we got here. How do we fit in? How is our planet different from other planets? And so there's a kind of um, value that's sort of deep within us, uh, sort, of, sort of like when you listen to a piece of music that you just love, or see some art that you love, or see beautiful scenery. There's, there's a richness that we all feel inside when we see something beautiful. And I think learning about our universe, how it was put together, uh, how our planet fits in, is, has that kind of beauty asso associated with it. We, we feel like our lives are enriched uh, just because we know what we're a part of and how we became a part of it. So that's really what astronomy is doing. Ironically, by looking out and studying the stars and the galaxies in the universe, we're really searching for our roots here back at home on the Earth. I agree with you. We may not benefit in any material way, but sometimes we have to realize that there are other important things out there. Namely, where do we come from and why are we here? Definitely. So I know I've been asking you some kind of grand questions, and we're not expecting you to say... This is the answer, and I absolutely know it, but you're probably the best person to ask out of anyone I've spoken with and probably ever will speak with. 
So if the goal is to figure out where we have come from, how far do you think we've gotten in terms of answering that question? And where does the science stop in terms of this is what we think and this is what we know? Yeah, it's this is a great question. And, you know, it's funny. Um, I'm, I have two answers that I'm formulating in my head as you were asking it. And so I'll give you, I'll give you both answers. On the one hand, um, we astronomers now have surveyed the universe going all the way back almost to the Big Bang. We still have questions about the nature of the Big Bang and the, the first few minutes and so on. But we understand planets around other stars. We, we, we have a few remaining questions like, are there Earth-like planets? We understand stars quite well, the galaxies that, are, that consist of stars. Uh, there's, there's some mysteries about dark matter and something called dark energy of which our universe is composed. So we have some profound questions for which we don't have the answers. But people generally think, well, we'll, we'll learn the answer to this, and then we'll have sort of crossed that T and dotted that I on the universe and figured it all out. Um, and so there's a sense that you know we're close to knowing virtually all there is to know with just a few outstanding niggly details. And, and so that's answer number one. Answer number two is, you complete idiot. Why would you answer number one the way you did? <laughs> uh, every every uh, um, you know era of, of, of humanity has imagined that they knew everything there was to know. Exactly, uh, exactly. And, and, and so we always, our imaginations are taxed. We're, we're, we humans aren't very good at seeing beyond the horizon. And so we see the questions that loom you know, in front of us, like this niggly dark energy and are there Earth-like planets and so on. And, and you know, is there life out there? Those are, those are good questions. Uh, but, but maybe there are even bigger questions. Maybe there's some other uh, science, some other technology. Maybe there's some other sort of reality that we just don't appreciate at all. And that's the way it's always been throughout humanity, that people were nearsighted. They thought that their uh, civilization was the right one or the only one that their their knowledge was the right or only knowledge and and we we've we've been proven wrong time and time again uh you know every every generation so i i've got to say we should remain quite humble and uh imagine that there's a lot out there and that we're not even asking the right questions yet right and that's why i prefaced it with i'm not expecting you to know all the answers but just to give me your best guess so i really appreciate that um, also, it's extremely relevant that I get to talk to you today because as of this recording, the space shuttle Atlantis landed, ending 30 years of shuttle flights. So perfect time to get to speak with someone like you. I wanted to get your opinion. Are we doing the right thing? Are we limiting our space program? Kind of how do you feel about that? This is a very good question about NASA, basically, and uh, uh, ESA in Europe is facing a similar question. You know, um, one thing has become obvious, I think, and that is uh, there's still a lot of promise in space travel, uh, especially traveling to Mars, uh, space probes to Jupiter, Saturn, exploring our solar system, using uh, powerful telescopes in space to study our universe. So the, the value in NASA has never been greater. Uh, going to the moon was good, but obviously we all want to go beyond. And the question is, how do you get there, literally and sort of uh, managerially, you might say? What, what is the model of NASA uh, from, a, from the administrative standpoint? What structure do we want so that the engineers and the scientists can do the best job that they, they can possibly do? And I think that what's happening is it's taken a sort of 15 or 20 years to figure it out, but we, I think as a society, we're learning that NASA has to work in a different way. It has to have a more competitive aspect in which uh, bidders uh, that can uh, do the work compete for doing that work, and, and the best company will, will do some of it, uh, with NASA sort of overseeing it as an umbrella organization. So there's a, a new notion that I think is, is actually correct, that we need to engage the, the competitive spirit, the, the capitalism that has made America strong and a lot of the rest of the world strong, bring that into bear so that um, the, the work that NASA needs to do can be done efficiently uh, with you know modest cost on time 
uh, and, you know, really keep the dreams alive of going to Mars and going beyond, putting colonies on other planets, but doing it with, within a cost a cost model, a cost cap that's, uh, you know, that's, that's manageable because we just don't have infinite, infinite amounts of money. So I think NASA is doing the right thing, and that this, this, the, the, the end of the shuttle era is a poignant moment for us to reflect what do we want, you know, what sort of exploration as a species will make us proud uh, from our generation, like Neil Armstrong, you know, made people proud in the 60s and 70s. You know, what, what's the way that we can explore the universe to, to make our mark historically uh, as an accomplishment for, uh, you know, for humanity? Yeah, and I agree. I think the competition will help us out. Hopefully we'll keep making these advancements and, you know, we'll keep moving on. Do you have any guess on how long we have until we're actually able to travel to Mars? Yeah, I, you know, I'm not an expert on, on uh, traveling to Mars, but I follow the, the, the activity pretty carefully. Um, unfortunately, it's not easy to go to Mars. It's, Mars is a lot farther away than the moon. Mm -hmm. And um, by a factor of sort of 100. And so you need spacecraft that can take you there. There are safety issues, human issues. I'll give you one that's frightening. Uh, if a solar flare goes off uh, while you're uh, on a spaceship traveling to Mars, the particles in that uh, solar wind, the explosion, uh, the particles can propagate into the spacecraft and uh, kill the, uh, the astronauts on board. So we need ways... To protect ourselves against these cosmic rays, the solar wind particles that can kill you, and uh, it was sort of lucky going to the moon that that never happened. So there's challenges just keeping humans alive right. during the, the journey that would take about a year to get to Mars, never mind getting them home uh, and keeping them on Mars in a colony. So th these are great challenges, and I'd give you a number. I'm I'm fairly sure we won't have humans on Mars within the next 25 years. But there's a real hope that you can do it in 30 or 40 years uh, if you put your mind to it. So the United States really has to uh, stand up with some leadership, and somebody has to say, just like the Apollo mission when Kennedy stood up and said, we will go to the moon and return him safely to Earth, we need to have uh, leaders stand up now and say, you know, it might take 35 or 40 years, but we will go to Mars and colonize and explore that planet. Uh, to learn about it and compare it to our home Earth. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because although it's before my era, my dad always said he remembers really well, and one of his kind of favorite moments in history is when Kennedy did say that about space travel, and then we kind of just made it happen. So I guess it was just the defining moment in political history. Yeah, and, and really what is beautiful about that is you can see so clearly how much we need strong and uh, thoughtful leadership. Um, and presidents have a, a lot of, of uh, capability to, to carry out that role, standing up, uh, you know, inspiring Congress to fund uh, a, a NASA mission. Uh, it takes that kind of leadership when, as somebody, when somebody articulates, somebody in the presidential position articulates the need uh, to, to do something, and then the whole country rallies behind it. But it really does take, uh, you know, some brilliant, uh, inspired individual in the White House to do it. And, and frankly, I think Obama is inspired enough to do this. And I hope someday he does stand up and say, here's, here's a great goal for humanity. It may not be immediately practical, but it will inspire our souls. And I think that's an important part of being a human being. I couldn't agree more. And I really hope it happens. Well, Jeff, I know I've taken up plenty of your time. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I really, really appreciate you being on the show. It's my pleasure. This was great. Now, I did want to ask you, do you have anywhere you'd like to lead our listeners, any websites you're interested in? Well, I would say the best thing to do that leaps to mind is to learn a little more about this Kepler Space Telescope. It's a sleeper and maybe as profound a mission as uh, NASA has done in the, in the last 20 years. And uh, if you go to, uh, to www.nasa.gov and uh, hunt for the Kepler telescope, you'll find out more about what NASA is doing with Kepler and the, the planets we're finding, the Earth-sized planets, and uh, how we're trying to verify them and learn whether they are indeed Earth-like. So, so Kepler is the place to, to learn more. 
That's fantastic. Well, again, thank you so much for being on the show, and I hope you continue to find more planets and expand our horizons. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure for me. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for listening to our interview with Dr. Marcy. Hope you enjoyed it and hope you learned a little something. If you feel like you are now smarter, feel free to tell us about it. You know, go to our website and just go to the contact us and give us a ring. Leave us a rating on iTunes, something like that. We appreciate hearing from you. Also, really important, we want to know who you want to hear from. Who do you want us to interview? Shoot us a note. It takes two seconds, and there's a 50-50 chance we can get them on the show. So, um, again, just, just let us know what you're thinking and keep enjoying. And don't forget, smartpeoplepodcast.com. The Amazon link is now at the top of the page. It's actually at the top and the bottom. You can still use the old one, but the one up top is easiest. You'll see a big Amazon banner up at the top. Click it. Go over to Amazon. Buy some cool stuff. Help out the podcast. And as always, you can follow us on Twitter, Smart People Pod, and on Facebook, Smart People Podcast. Make sure to tune in next week. We are actually doing the interview tomorrow, and that's the one we plan on having this coming week. I don't think I want to give it away. I think I'm going to hold you in suspense. So thanks for listening. See you soon. <laughs>